struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, the belt, Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the scriptures, learn the word of God. This is how we resist the devil. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior. Because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God. And we receive the breastplate of righteousness so that when the devil shoots his fiery darts, they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly, he says, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It means that you should have the peace of God in your heart. The serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come, Satan will not be able to get close to you. And then fourthly, the Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith and you put on that helmet and that helmet protects you against the enemy. And then there's the sword and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. And the scripture says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the word of God. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Check your arm. Is it in place? Uh, it gives me an opportunity to sort of finish that uh, message to uh, the Ephesians. They, uh, we, I was sitting talking to my neighbors over there, Nancy, and Nancy and I got talking about, you know, I wonder what people think that the problem was with the Ephesians. And we read all the, all the beautiful, positive things that he said in the book of Ephesians to them. But we, we were wondering, what, what, was the, what was the problem? Why did he still accuse them of losing their first love? And immediately we both thought of the same thing, you know, and that is, well, maybe because everybody in the Ephesians church had something going on that no one knew about. Maybe it had a little secret something going on inside of them that they never, that they never uh, dealt with. That's the first thing we thought about. Because we all know that, that uh, you know, some people say when you go to heaven, they're going to show, show you a big picture of your life. God forbid. You know, if you ever knew some of my secrets, uh, I can't tell you. Because we, we all struggle with things that other people don't know about. And we, and we bring them before the Lord and a, lo, and a lot of them he takes away and he deals with, but a lot of them we're still, any, anybody here still have something that you know you should get rid of to be, make you more Christ-like? Well, there's a couple that are here with me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, isn't it true? So there's, there's, there's some other thing that he was talking about with these Ephesians, which made him say that, no, you know, he didn't rebuke them. He didn't cast them out. He didn't reject them. He just said, I, I just got something. You, you've lost your first love. You've, you, you've lost that which 
evidently it's very important to God. But, you know, when I read some of the things that he, that he complimented them on, he says they had patience. They said, he said they can't bear evil. They even tested those who, who taught them to find out whether they were teaching them right. They persevered. They labored for my name's sake. They didn't become weary. You know, and, and all those things I'm saying, man, these are great things. And I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to pastor a church that had people that God would say all those beautiful things about them. But yet there's something else in church, and it's for our church too. There's something else in church that makes us a drawing card, that makes us different than any other church. And it's your first love. It's, it's something that goes on in you that draws people to Christ. They like what they see in you. Not everything because it's easy to pick out your fault, but they like what they see in you. Let's pray. Father, help us to see this. I labored over this, Lord. I, I just want so much to, when I teach this word, I'm, I'm like Pastor Tom. I, I just want to, I want to be right, Lord. I don't want to be preaching any churchy thing. I, I, want, I want God to receive the, the, the acknowledgement of, of the work that he's done in us and and I want, Lord God, to, to grow some, even though I'm 83 years old, I still want to grow. And I ask you, Lord God, to, to teach us. You teach us. You bless us. Give me the ability to say what you, what you want me to say, Lord. Bless us, I pray in your name. Amen. So he says that the only problem that was existing within their church, that evidently they must have... They must have been sympathetic toward to some degree because it still was affecting them. There still was something there that they were pushing toward, that they were leaning toward, even though a lot of things were great. And, you know, there was just something there. And I'll tell you what it was. It's getting churchy. See, I was taught in, in one of the seminaries I went to, or maybe two of them, that the church is like the world, it's like government, it's like a business. And it's a triangle, see? And at the top is the CEO, and in the church, the top is the pastor. Now, he's responsible to make sure that those under him, his deacons and elders and presbyters, whatever he had within his church, that they got their needs so they could take care of the people underneath of them who were also leaders, maybe Sunday school teachers and stuff like that, and they would take care of their students and the people underneath them. And then all of us on along the bottom are the people who have the greatest needs, which are those, the shut-ins and those who, the elderly, and those who really need a lot of help. That's what I was taught. But you know what I found out? That's upside down. That's upside down. The people with the greatest needs within the church are the ones that should get the greatest attention. And everything, including, and including the pastor, is to make sure that these needs are being met. See, and, and when you have a church that, that's paying attention to what God is doing, then you'll, you'll see old people, you'll see young people, you, you know, you'll see kids. Why? Well, because when people come here, and we see this here, the needs are being met. The kids are being taught. The moms and dads feel it's good to come to this place because maybe when I get as old as, as Bill, maybe someone will still be taking care of me. So take a hint. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but it's, it's turned upside down. You know, 1 Corinthians sort of chapter 13, and I'm, I'm going to be all over the place. This is the poorest exhibition of expository preaching you've ever heard. Okay, I'm glad my... My professors aren't here, but I got a message from my heart for you. See, now, now 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this, for, for as the body is one, now listen, as the body is one and has many members, and all members of that are that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You're one. You're one body. Folks, look around you. These are the same people you're going to be looking at in eternity. 
Now, I don't know. I heard that we, get, we start looking like we're around 35 years old. Now, I'll go for that. I don't want to be the same age when Jesus comes. I hope that, that I'm going to be young and, you know, now you don't want to hear that either. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body. Get this, brother. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink of one spirit. We're all one. I don't care where you came from. I don't care where your background is. I, all I know is that when you became in Christ, you were a new creation. Old things were passed away. All things become new. You became one with Christ. Don't, don't think that, that, you know, you're going to be like that guy that went to heaven. And, and, he, and he says, let me show you all the churches in heaven. And, he, and he's, he's, he's walking down this lane in different churches, you know. And, and he says, I want you to be real quiet when you go by this one. And, and he says, well, why? He says, well, they're Baptists and they think they're the only ones that are here. You're here and you're going to be there because you are part of the body of Christ. My family, that's, that's who you are. And the body, verse 14 says, for the body is not one member, but it's many. And, and then he goes on explaining, and one part of the body can never say to the other part of the body, you're not important. Do you know the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you? Sure you do, you need them. And the nose can't say to the ears, I don't need you, you know, or the mouth, you know, all, we're all important. Regardless of whether you might think you're just the belly button, and that's just right in the middle of everything, but good for nothing. But according to what I know about the belly button, at one time it was, the, it was what nurtured life for that body. See, so the little part that you have, and you might think, oh, I just keep receiving, I keep receiving. Well, if you keep receiving, someone needs the ministry of serving you. So, you know, I, I was preaching to this big group of uh, kids, and, and I said, who do you think is the most important here? And they all said, you are baloney you are <laughs> because if you weren't there I wouldn't have a ministry you're important but you've got to realize the thing that looks the most attractive to the world is the fact that you 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 seem to love each other you seem to care for one another you don't seem to to pick each other apart and when I use that little illustration about the Baptist, you didn't cringe. <laughs> See, it's all the fact that, that, that we're one and, and the triangle is working good because we're thinking our first thoughts were of our pastor who was, who was, who was sick. And, and that's, that's attractive. That's what we want. That's what we hope for. You know, it, it's, it's, all, it's all the work it's all the work of God. But, you know, when, 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 we looked, when we looked at Ephesians, we, we saw those beautiful, all those beautiful things uh, that he said, you know, and, and, we, and we believe it. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 19, and, and I'm going to be all over the place like I told you about it too. Verse 19 through 22 said this. It says, Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but listen, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole body fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple unto the Lord in whom ye are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. See, that, that's what you are. You're, you're, the body of, you're the body of Christ. You're the one to, to reach out. That's why he said to you, uh, go ye into all the world and, and preach that gospel to every creature. Why? You know, or as you're going into all the world, preach that gospel to everyone. And that's why we said how, how important it is that, that what's going on in me is something that's, in, that's attractive. That in my... In, in, I want to be in... And there's my neighbor, you'll have to ask her. I want to be in my neighborhood as a person who's a giver and not a receiver. 
I, I want them, them to see, I want them to see Christ in me. I want them to see that, that whenever there's someone they need help, uh, I'm gonna be, I, for my neighbors, I went out and I bought a generator so that if we ever get a time when the electric goes out, I can make sure that their freezes, freezers don't get, r lose all the food in their freezers. That's important to me. I want to make sure that, that what my neighbors see, and you never know this, you don't know this, is, is Christ. See, that, that's really what I, what I want. And, and, and I'll tell you, I got a very poor record in churches. Boy, this is true. I've started churches that as soon as I left, or very soon after I left, they closed. We, we went to, to uh, Greenville, or Greenfield, uh, Ohio, and, and we pastored there, I think, for nine months. We grew. Every church had the same, approximately the same experience. We had at least 30 people got saved the first month. We had people got saved. We got a new, new birth uh, class uh, started and everything. And, and, and in that church in Ohio, I even painted the downstairs like Noah's Ark, you know, with animals and stuff like that. We had a beautiful time. But the Lord called us to come back to, to, to New Jersey. And I, I thought it was so crazy, although I don't now, because I know that two very good ministers came out of that came out of that church. One of them we had lunch with yesterday or day before yesterday. You know, God showed me why he did that. But after we left and, and after we moved, we served there for, for seven years. And after we left, the, some guy came in. And by that time, we had, we, you know, we had bought a building and, and everything. Some guy came in and without us knowing it, he was using the money he was getting from the church to start another church up in the Poconos. And the church closed. See, and I didn't, I didn't recognize this. And then another church that we worked with and we built up and God blessed us so beautifully with, they, you know, when we left, the pastor came in and he decided he and his wife were going to take care of the money from the church. Well, <laughs> you know the end of that story. It wasn't long before that church folded too. So I got a poor record. So maybe I'm a bad one to be standing up here talking to you. But in every one of those churches, I had people do the same thing. You know what? They said to me, we got phone calls. We got everything. People said, you know, you will always be my pastor. Why? Because while we were there, we were a family. And we loved each other and we grew for, with each other and we, we cared for one another and cared for one another's needs. Just last week, I called a fellow and I knew his, he lost his wife a year ago, called him and he said, you know what, he says, this is funny. He says, but as soon as I heard your voice, a smile came to my face. Now, I went, I have some scary times too. I, had, I went to an eighth grade graduation and this guy looked like he just came from Iraq, and he was actually a Syrian. Walked up to me, put his hands on my face like this, and said, you don't remember me, do you? I wished I had at that time. He says, you came and prayed for, to my house and prayed for my baby. You know, see, people, the things that we do that are Christ-like, the things that we do that are bigger than us and mean more to us. Right now, you know, the things that we do to stay together now, keep Pastor Tom in, in our prayers. He's gone, he's gone through a lot, Pastor Tom has. But you, you ask me, he's one of the best preachers that I know of. He's a fantastic man of God, but he's suffering. Now, what do, what, how does the body of Christ respond to suffering? Well, that we, we're waiting to see, aren't we? See, and, and that's important. See, and the, and the problem that they had in, in Ephesians was they had, they had these guys that came in and they, see, basically the Nicolaitans thought that everything that was made of the flesh is no good. But everything that's spiritual, that's good. 
So the leaders of the church, they're spiritual. They're good. But the church, <laughs> they need help, man. They're bad. See? And God was so much against that because that's, that's, really, that's really not true because within that they were saying that Jesus, while he walked in the flesh, couldn't have really been good because he was in the flesh. See, and you can imagine how God responded to that. Well, you, the name Nicolaitans, when I look it up, literally means to conquer the people. Sound, sort of sounds like our government, doesn't it? But, oops, excuse me. But, you know, it, it, literally, it literally sponsors separation. See, and God, God isn't into that. God doesn't want that. So what I found out in all those bad experiences I had in all those churches I didn't have success in, they had the thing happen which was the warning in Revelation your candle will go out. Now, it means that once when you were, when, when your church was something that everybody wanted to go to, all of a sudden nobody wants to go to, the candle goes out and the church is closed. So in Greenfield, Ohio, there's a big, beautiful church with a building for kids and closed. In Washington, New Jersey, the it was a big, beautiful building built, and now it's owned by some business. What's going to happen to us? How are we going to respond as, as a body? Right? You know? What? I, I, you know, we, we, blame, we blame COVID. You know, and I guess even Calvary Chapel blames COVID because they closed the Bible school for Calvary Chapel in Marietta because of COVID. Isn't that what Jerry said, honey, yesterday? You know, because of COVID. What a time we're in right now. What a test with COVID. What a time for someone to come and say, we want you people out of that building. What a time. Do you see some, someone's handiwork in here that, that wants your candle to go out? It's Slewfoot, and you, and you know it is. Right? What, what a test. Well, why was it, why is it so hard? Well, it's hard to come to church and wear a mask, isn't it? Mm -hmm. right? Isn't it true? Because my mask was either saying, I don't want you getting what I got, and I don't want to get what you got. Now, that doesn't happen within a church that's the body of Christ, does it? No, I, it, it doesn't work. It sounded, sounded funny to it. It meant, I have to be careful of you, and, and we have to be careful of one another. I've been to churches like that. Have you ever been to a church like that? You know, where you get hollered at because this little old lady, you sat in her seat, and had her name on it. Yeah, you all have had that experience. I know you do. That's my seat. That's where I always sit. And good, good for them. I'm glad they're still coming to church. Some just stayed at, stayed at home rather than take the, and, and that was their choice, right? But COVID did that. Isn't that, can't you see that as one of the greatest works of Satan that he ever came up with? To how many churches, there's a lot of churches have closed. A lot of pastors have left the ministry because of COVID. Because they couldn't handle the fact that, that all of a sudden they couldn't do or, or produce what they wanted to produce. But folks, I got news for you. Pastors don't produce the churches. God produces the churches. And, and that leaves you with, with, with a, a, a question. How, how are you going to respond to, to this? See, and, 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 that, and that's important. See, Satan's behind it. I mean, he wants to get rid of the church. He's, he laughs at, the, at that, you know. And, and we understand it. Why? Because the scripture says, unless a man is born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God. You can't see how these things are going to affect you or are going to affect your world. But we see it. Don't we see it, sister? We see it. But that leaves us with a question. Are we going to let that blow out the candle? Are we going to shut the lights off in the church? 
Or are we going to all stay together, be strong, and let God get the glory over how these people responded to that need? And I say that's the right choice because that's what puts the body to Christ. I gave, I gave my brother a, a book. Where is he? He, he? Oh, there he is back there called uh, Body Life. And, and, I, and I love it because it's a book written way back by Pastor Ray Stedman, who's now with the Lord. He died in 1992. But that the church is like a body. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what, you know, what you know, we're heavily influenced. It doesn't matter. You're the body of Christ. God, Christ lives inside of you. And I want to see Christ in you. Because I need what Christ can do in you to me. You know, I, 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 that's important to me. I love church growth, but you can grow big and not be what the body of, of God, that God wants. See? Now, re remember, uh, Revelation 2.5 says, Remember from, from when you're fallen and repent and do the first works, else I come unto thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of its place, except you re repent. You use that, reper return, that word repent over and over again. It just means that take a look at yourself. What's going on inside of you? You know, the same thing that can look like a disaster a church closes can look like a tremendous success because you know something? Those people stuck together. I have one church that did that. And it's, it's still going up in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. They stuck together. That's why I wish, I wish Steve was here, brother, because I had people like Steve and, and Audrey you know, he's a kook. He's really a kook. He's, he's wacko. But I love the guy to pieces, and, and we tease each other. And, and they hung with us and stayed with us. And when people came to church, they went to their home and they visited them. And they invited people up to their home. They lived up by the lake. And, they, and, and you never went near them, but you didn't feel like, you know what, you're really with people who really love you. And, and, and that's the kind of thing that builds it together. That's the kind of thing that makes you what, what God wants you to be. And it really doesn't matter where you came from, what your experience is. It, Christ, if Christ is in you, that love is, is in you. But you gotta be, you got to know yourself. You know? know yourself because you might have some, some limitations. And, and I think Jesus wanted to teach Peter that, you know, Peter, you got to be careful because there could be some experience you've had or something happened within your life which gave you some limitations. So, Jesus comes to Peter and after, you know, remember they fished all night and didn't catch anything. And he came to Peter and says, uh, he, you know, this is after Peter denied Jesus three times. You know, it's one of those situations where if you went to Peter, you'd probably say, hey, Peter, does three mean anything to you? But Jesus isn't like that. He's not like us. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. Oh, there's a little something in the Greek there. When he said, Peter, do you love me? He uses the word agape. Peter, do you love me like I love you? And Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo. I love you like a brother. So he asked him again, he says, Peter, do you love me like I love you? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. It sounds like Peter had learned something, didn't he? And the third time, Jesus said, Peter, do you love me like a brother? And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. See, I, we, I got to know my limitations. I, gotta, I, I can't be walking around thinking I'm something perfect, the holiest thing on two wheels. I need, to, I need to know myself. That's why we pray. That's why I spend so much time in the Word of God. That's why in most 
days from 5 o'clock till 8 o'clock, I pray through my whole family and I pray because I know me. I know what's going on inside of me. I want to please God within my life. I don't want things to enter into my life that hurt me. And I was that way as a pastor. And as what we found out, you know, my wife and I dedicated ourselves to, as soon as a visitor came to church, we'd go visit, visit them. Steve and Audrey used to do that. Everybody came to church, they'd go visit them. And that said something to people. That said that you care about how I live and you care about what I've dealt with and you want to know my history. And I used to love that. Even when I went to, on, you know, to, like to Virginia Tech and we'd go and stay at someone's home and, and, and I would love it when they would pull out their, their, their albums of, of memories that they have because God loves people. And as you're loving people, you can't help but find opportunities to minister to them because then they show you their needs. And that's when you need to respond Christ-like. What's it all about? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and what else? Love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that right? That's what it says. Sorry, Nance, but I'm your neighbor. I'm going to love you anyway. She's a brat, though, because she tried to, she wanted to squirt me with a hose the other day. And she says, you know what I got in my hand? Yeah, see, well, I can't, I can't tell you all the bad things about, about Nancy. <laughs> the house that we moved into, she had taken care of the, the lady who was sick for two years, three years. And I know what kind of heart that lady has. See, that's what God wants. That's what God has. He, he, he prayed that, that we would be one even as he is one in Christ. You look around. You might not even know the name of people that are here, but they need you. They need your testimony. They need your love. They need to know that, that you care enough about what's happening here that you're praying for them and you're praying, you're praying for yourself. You don't need a major intervention, you know. You just need to change your mind as to some things within your, within your heart, within your life. Because I am, you know. When I got saved, I, I was thinking about people getting saved too. I was excited about my family coming to the Lord. My family was all lost. I never even heard about being born again till I was born again. I never even heard of that. And I went to my family and they never heard about being born again. And one by one, they started coming to the Lord. And I told you that story. The greatest day of my life is when the first time I preached out in the church, my dad and mom came and my dad walked the aisle to receive Christ. The first time, and I thought he'd never do that. Why that old welder? He was an old welder. You know, welders, they have a hood on and all day long they smell their own bad breath and they're looking at a light. You know what I mean? Can you imagine how? Well, I was a sheet metal worker, so I understand that. But you don't need a major intervention. You know, I looked up intervention. It's a retreat. It's a surrender. It's a withdrawal. It's a backing down. It's pulling back. It's... I need to run to love. See, you look at yourself. How am I doing with the Lord? Am I the way I was when I first got saved? Is that exciting about me? Well, you know, I would have devotions, but I really don't have time in the morning. And, or I can't have devotions at night because I'm too tired. And uh, honey, you pray because, for the meal because the dad don't pray uh, very good. You know, uh, well, I'm not going to church today. I heard the, the fish are biting down in the surf and I'm going to, you know what I mean? And excuses, excuses to keep yourself from being the person that you know God really wants you to be. Now fill a place up with people who love God like that and who worship and come into the house of God because I love to worship God. I love to hear God. Pastor Tom, teach me something that's going to help me with my life and help me to live the way God wants me to live. And, and I'm going to listen. And, and, he, and he keeps you listening. He keeps you listening because he moves around a lot. You know what I mean? I, I, 
I, I don't do that. I'd be, I'd, be tired. I'd be tired too fast. You know, but know yourself. And, and, and again, don't promise what you, what you can't uh, deliver. But I wanted my kids to love the Lord too. I wanted my kids to know that, 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 I, that I care about them. I wanted my son to know that, that you know all about me, son, because you're living in my house. I want you to know that I love you and that God loves you. And, and I wanted my kids to know Christ. But I left it up to them. I left it up to them how they were going to respond to it. I didn't preach to them. I prayed to them. Prayed for them. I wanted to see them grow. I wanted them to, to see what it's like to be part of the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters. Living, loving, caring for, for one another. And, and that, that means a lot. That means a lot to me. Because I, 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 I worked in a nursing home for, for, for a while. And, and, and I saw one of the saddest things you'd ever want to see. And that was I, I, I saw people would come in to visit and the person that they visited would be so miserable that they didn't come back again. I mean, I saw very few visitors came in to visit the church. Did I tell you about the lady that I would go in to visit and she would say, uh, pray for me, Pastor. Please pray for me. I want to go home. I want to go home. I said, well, maybe God's got something else for you. No, I want to go home. Pray for me. And we'd sing together. We'd, we'd pray together. And she'd practice dying. She'd go. And then she'd be so disappointed that she didn't die. So one couple of weeks later, I went in there and she said, Pastor, I've got to tell you something. I don't want you to ever tell anybody. Now, I'm telling you this once, so be careful, because promised, I promised her I wouldn't repeat it. She said, guess what? She says, I led my little nurse to the Lord this morning. And shortly after that, she went home. See, God's in all this. He's in all this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a great big question mark asking, how are you going to respond? Oh, well, that's easy. I'm going to go down the street or I'm going to go here or something else. Well, you don't want to be part of that candle going out. You can learn through what you're experiencing here. And, and that's what he was saying to, to, to the Ephesians. You're, you're not really learning through what you're going through. You're letting these guys be bullied over you. And you're letting them think they're real holy and you're nothing. You're letting them boss you around and do... No, you are as important as they are. You're part of the body and you're part of the love of God and part of that, that church. Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For I, the Lord your God, am with you wherever you go. Isn't that true? Rest in the Lord. And wait patiently for him. See? Why? Because he's going to come and he's going to help you and he's going to strengthen you and enable you to be and learn what God wants you to learn through this. And some are suffering through it. And some, some have gone on to be, to be with the Lord. But remember, God has a plan for you. And it's a plan for a future and a hope. You know, the worst thing in the world isn't my leaving this earth and going to be with God. That's not the worst thing. Matter of fact, that's probably the best thing, isn't it? But I want to stay because I'd like to do a little more work. We, I, know, I know how we think. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and, and hope. See, I'm part of, of an eternal family, as, I, as what I said, and so are you. We're held together by, by arms of, of, of love. And how do I know that? Well, because Father gave his son of only 33 years old to die for you and for me so that I could live, so that I could know what life is. 
You know, did you, you know, you, you get this big, big argument. Well, we don't believe in Jesus and everything like that. Well, I'm one person that if Jesus Christ didn't die on a cross, I would have never even heard of God and I would have, I would not be saved. And I, and, and Lord knows what kind of person I would be in this world. I'm thankful for him. And I'm thankful for what he wants to do in us. I'm held together by, by, by arms of love. Uh, well, you might have the big uh, church building someday. We don't know that, but what we really hope is that the, the church is one, like you're going to read in that book, is one in the bond of love. Because that's the thing that, that's the thing that holds us together. Remember Peter said, or, or remember your scripture we read last week said this, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. See, this wrestle that's going on right here has one purpose. This whole COVID thing has one purpose, to close off as many people to God as, as, can, as they can possibly do in one thing. And boy, wasn't it a success. Isn't it true? Look at the effect that it's had upon our world and even upon, upon us. But that's not a bad thing. For I know that all things work together for the good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. What's his purpose? The next verse says, to conform you to the image of God, to make you more godlike. Because you get a bunch of people who are all godlike, and there's a light there. That's why you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. See? That's, that's what we're here for. That's what God's doing within us. But it's a wrestle. So he tells us to go and tell the world. It, you know, and he, he, he tells us that, that you shall be my, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the, word, the earth. You know what the word witnesses translates? Martyrs. He gives you the Holy Spirit so that you will be a martyr for Christ. Well, what's a martyr? A, a martyr is a person who says, you know what, I don't care, I'm living for Christ, and if you're going to take my life because I'm living for, for Christ, then, then, take, then take my life. See, so he, he constantly tells us, Paul constantly tells us to die out to yourself and start to live for him. And, and that's the way it was when you were first saved. You really didn't care. When you were baptized, what was that a symbol of? Uh, symbol of? Romans chapter 6, reckon the old man as dead and the new man as alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Isn't that what he said? See, that's what he wants from me. Because with that, he's going to do a miracle and we're not going to be putting our light out. In our, you know, and, and we talked about that last week. Yeah, I have to ask myself, is my light on when I'm at work? It, it, do my children see the light? Do, do the people, my neighbors see the light? See, I, I, don't, I don't know. What's it all about? Living for his will. Jesus dying so that I'd give up my selfish self to live for him and do what he wants me to do. And, and it can be hard. It can be tough. Love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. And, and, and my neighbor, she, she's a little, little Jewish gal. She's a <laughs> Jewish princess. <laughs> she's so cute and it's so neat. And the other day I, I watched her and, and, and she was messing with the hose and kept squirting her. And, you know, but, but when, she, when I found out she was just saved and, and her husband was just saved, you know, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, now you make sure that she gets followed up and she gets help and she learns what it's like to walk with Christ. And I can't tell you how many things she's had happen to her, how many difficult things, but in everything I end up seeing the work of God within her life. For instance, She's, she knows, she's, she, she's like Ford, she has a better idea. I've been putting spray on all the flowers from all my neighbors because we got, we got deer that go through there in herds and they like to eat off all the flowers, right? So, so I bought some stuff that you spray on the flowers and they won't eat it, they won't eat them. 
right? Well, she's, Jewish people sometimes have a better idea. She says, that stuff's very expensive. I'm going to make my own. Okay, so she made her own, I don't know, vinegar and peppermint and a whole bunch of stuff. And you, you want me to make some for you? And I said, no, that's all right. I'll use the same stuff I used, right? Well, wouldn't you know that, that the other day she went out and all her flowers were all picked apart and eaten. She had bought some nice big new plants and they ate all the flowers. They ate all the buds. They ate everything. She was so disappointed. Oh, my goodness. You would have thought she, she lost the best thing in the whole world. She was very, very disappointed, right? Well, about a year ago, she lost her little dog. It was a little poodle, a little tan poodle. poodle. Now, just get this. That night, someone gave her a dog that looked just like the dog that she lost. And now she's so excited about that little dog, she's not feeling real bad about her flowers. Now, isn't that God? That night, you see, and you don't realize it, but God is working miracles in your life too. He's working miracles. You know, like I say, that when you go to heaven, then he might teach you some of the things that he's kept you from or some of the ways he's helped you and, and given you. My kids, oh, I can't tell you. They've been so good to us. They wanted to buy us the house. They, you know, but it's, it's all the work of God and it's all what God wants to do in, in, in us. My eternal family. I went to visit this family and, and the, the, uh, his, the man's wife that I went to visit, he was very, very sick. He was dying of cancer. She says, you know what John did when, when, when he heard that you were coming today? And I says, no. He says, he sat on his bed and he cried. You know, we're important to people. I'm not trying to elevate myself. We're important to people. The love that we give to people, the things that we are, the things my neighborhood thinks of me, the things my workplace thinks of me, or my school thinks of me. You know, they're judging whether what I got is real or what I got isn't real. And they're seeing God in you. They're looking for God in you. They're looking for God in us. You think, think there aren't people looking to say, I wonder how they're going to deal with that. I wonder what they're going to do. Well, right now we're thinking, let's get Pastor Tom strong. Well, God will take care of the church thing. I know that. But let's pray for Pastor Tom that, that he gets strong and that, that God, that God raises, raises him up. You know, and it's, it's all about love, isn't it? Isn't it all about love? That's the thing. That's the thing that we're, that we're talking about here. 1 Corinthians again, chapter 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Love doesn't behave itself unseemingly. It doesn't seek their own and isn't easily provoked. It doesn't think evil. Love doesn't rejoice in sin, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. See, I look at my life, I look at my family, I look at my church, I look at wherever, and the thing I hope they catch the most is they are loved. They are cared for. God cares for them. God is going to help me to be part of their life. And, and not a bad testimony. Even if I apologize, I squirted you with a hose first, Nancy. Yeah. I, I have to confess, but it was fun. Let's close it with Romans chapter 8, the end. Okay? What do we say then? That's what he's saying. Romans 8, 33. You know, uh, what, who shall bring charge against these? Who shall lay anything to charge God's elect? It's God who justifies us. 
Who is he who condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for a slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things that come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. It's, all, it's all up to him. We're right, Mel. We say it over and over. It's a, it's a big fix. God has it all planned. You know what, folks? We're going to make it. But is he going to do his work in you? And what he's saying here is, return to your love of God that you once knew greatly. And let God lead your life. Father, help us. Help us to be that person, Lord. We don't, I don't want to stand before you, Lord, and come up with a whole bunch of excuses. Well, that's why I did this, and that's why I couldn't do this, and that. I don't want that, Lord. I want, Lord... And I'm not like one that can't wait to get up there, receive my crown. Lord, if I get a crown, that'll be all the more that I don't deserve. Because you, Lord God, know our hearts and you know, you know the changes we need to make within our life. And these are your kids here, Lord. And I just pray that, that they're ready to make some changes. I pray, Lord, not, not through, through sharing uh, this word, but somehow your spirit has laid your hand on something that one of my brothers and sisters here need to change because it's affecting their life or their marriage or their children or who they are at school. I just pray, Lord God, that you'd be there and you'd help them and you'd strengthen them. Father, lay your hand upon these folks. Help them to know that, that you're, they're your kids and you intend to get them through this and they, wait till they see what you have prepared for them. And I pray, Lord God, you'd be with our pastor, be with Pastor Tom. Tom, he's, he's such a great guy, Lord. I love him. But Lord, he's suffering, so still in bed. And I pray, Lord God, you'd lay your hands upon him. You encourage him. You'd give him strength. You'd give him love. And now maybe someone saw this thing and listened to my thoughts of Christ and Christ first and and they'd have to say, you know, I don't, I don't know this experience with God. I want to experience God. Well, let me tell you how. All you got to do is admit that you need him. Lord, I'm a sinner. I, I, I need your salvation. I really need to be saved. I don't know this love that you're talking about. My world hasn't loved me too much. I need to know love. I need God to be with me. So I confess, Father, I'm a sinner and I need salvation. Please, please, God, save me and love me and give me life. So, Father, please save those who might be saved. Change us, Lord. It's an opportunity, Lord, for us to just give you what, what we know you've been talking to us about, what you want to change within us. And I pray, Lord, you hold your hand upon us too. Help us to find a place, Lord, to to be comfortable in where we can reach people of all ages and continue to preach the word of God with, with boldness and confidence. So, Father, please strengthen us. Give us, Lord, that's our need. You said we have not because we ask not. Right now, that's what our need is, Father. First, for Tom's healing, and second, for a place to, to continue our love for one another. So, Father, bless us and strengthen us and encourage us, I pray in your name. Amen. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That he gave his only begotten son. 
that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him that whosoever believeth in him that whosoever believeth in him should not perish should not perish should not perish but have everlasting life but have everlasting life but have everlasting life now how does god save by grace but god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever and you can write your name in there i can write mine whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and you have here with the word believe the little preposition in it means to believe in christ means to trust him as the one who bore the penalty for your sins and that he died in your room and in your stale but the greatest love story of all time is summed up in these 25 words that someone is called a miniature bible the gospel in a nutshell for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life